All right, so <clears throat> the sort of usual thing has happened uh, in uh, lectures um, that I'd like to give. I, and this one I thought, I have one hour and 45 minutes times five lectures. That's so infinite, it's great. I'll get to talk about all these things and uh, not quite. But I still would like to say, I want to say one more thing about, uh, about the ideas that we're just uh, talking about. And then um, I'll try to spend the last part of this lecture at least telling you something about the second topic that I had promised to tell you about, which are um, uh, positivity constraints on effective field theories um, beyond the sort of old ones that we knew about a long time ago um, and how they're actually related to these interesting geometries. Okay? Um, as I said, the geometries they're related to is actually more closely the uh, geometries associated with the amplitohedron <laughs> and not with these isosahedra. I haven't told you really anything about the amplitohedron, but we'll, anyway, we'll describe something and you'll, uh, I'll tell you many of the sort of cool things that you'll, that you would, uh, that come up directly in the question about, uh, about uh, positivity bounds for effective field theory. And then if you're interested later in learning about the amplitohedron, you'll see very similar things showing up there. All right. <clears throat> but the first thing that I want to do is go back to our sort of uh, wave equation picture here and talk about what some generalizations are. of this wave equation picture. Um, after all, somehow we have this picture in kinematic space that we have this picture in kinematic space that just computes tree amplitudes, right? Now, we might want to have something that computes one loop amplitudes. And, and something that's going to be sort of very manifest from the kind of uh, things that we're talking about associated with polytopes, blah, 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 is that we're not getting the actual amplitude. You know, the actual one loop amplitude maybe has logarithms, dilogarithms, just a complicated transcendental function. What we can get from this uh, picture are rational functions, right? Things that have poles. We're going to associate poles with the facets of, of, some, of some geometry and so on. And there's a natural thing we could be talking about, which is the integrand of the amplitudes before we do the loop integrals. Okay? So if you have the integrand, then. Um, then you have to, again, keep track of a bunch of variables, right? So um, just, just to give you a picture, let's say I want to talk about this sort of loop diagram, OK? This loop diagram has four propagators in it. So, so there are four poles. Um, and once again, any planar picture like this has a dual. So what is the dual of this picture? Um, well, it's like we have our. When, when we're doing four-point scattering, we had one, two, three, four, right? And to get the tree diagram, we did a sort of triangulation like this. Okay? To get a loop diagram, then you have to imagine that there's kind of a point in the middle of the space, kind of like a puncture or a hole in the middle of the space, and that you're allowed to triangulate well with using this point. So for example, you could draw this diagram. Okay? That is a triangulation of the of the of the square using this point in the middle, right? And what diagram does this correspond to? Well, it corresponds to this one. And if we look at the, we draw the dual, once again, we put a point here, point there, point there, point there, and we draw something like this. OK? So once again, we're looking at triangulations of a, of a, of a polygon, but now with a point in the middle. And, OK? If we're doing, if we're doing um, say we're doing cubic graphs, okay, so same thing. We'd have a triangle. We'd have a point in the middle. I could draw this one, OK? And that guy is dual. This guy is dual to a triangle diagram, <coughs> OK? We can do other things, right? We could have some of the, you know, I, I could have, uh, for instance, um, I could have draw another one here. So here is my my hole in the middle. One, two, three, four. This is a triangulation, right? And what is this diagram? Well, again, we could put these things in the middle if we like. OK? 
Okay, so that's like, uh, clearly there's something that looks like factorization here, but on one side to get a three-point amplitude, right? Okay, so this is just to show that the sort of basic things keep going, right? So now if I want to talk about the kinematic space, the kinematic space are still xijs, right? Except now there's an amusing difference. Xij is not necessarily the same as xji, right? Because I can decide whether as I go from i to j, I go around one side of the hole or the other side of the hole, right? So I have a hole there, and if I go, uh, if I, if, as I go from i to j, I wind around in one direction, I would call that one variable. If I wind around the other direction, I'll call it another variable, okay? So I'm just giving you some, some, some names for variables that, that we'll see. I'm not going to have time to describe this in much detail, but I just want you to see. So, um, so, uh, so here, this would be x13. Let's say by convention, we'd say that we're always going to go, we're always going to keep the puncture to our right, right? So this would be x13, that would be x31, and they're different from each other. Okay, so that's one kind of variable we have. So we have xij, but now xij is not equal to xji. Okay, then we can have other variables, like something that just goes for, uh, what you could call like x loop i, right? Something that goes from i to the internal point. And that's just like what we saw are the kind of loop variables here, okay? <clears throat> We can even have this interesting variable. You see, x12 is 0, but we can have x12 that goes around the hole. All right? And what, what is that variable? That corresponds to a bubble on an external line. So if you imagine you took this and I finished triangulating by putting something there, let's say, and putting something there. That's a funny triangulation, but that's giving me this picture. <coughs> right? And so on. Okay, so there's even tadpole diagrams. Um, and here, I won't keep going. Um, I just want to give you an idea that, that we once again have a kinematic space that now involves the loop variables. And those variables are again naturally associated with the triangulation of a surface, but with a hole in the middle. And the sort of dual of those diagrams are uh, one loop diagrams. Okay? We still have a kinematic space. And now, you can see now there's going to be a more intricate pattern of what poles are allowed, not allowed, <laughs> together, and so on. Okay? In fact, let's just say a little impressionistically. <clears throat> Let's sort of summarize what are, what was important, very impressionistic level, for a tree amplitude. So this was a tree. If I denote this is what the tree amplitude looks like. What was the important thing about the factorization? So the, the important thing we learned is that there's a, there's a polytope associated with this guy and that it factorizes on the boundaries. And the factorization reflects the factorization of amplitudes, right? What is that factorization, therefore, is that the boundary of this guy, I'll call it boundary, or pole, right? These are, this is an impressionistic thing, but boundary or pole is just the product of two things of the same type. Right? Okay, now let's imagine what is the analog of what we're looking for here at one loop. Let me... See, now we have these variables xij, xji, x loop i, xi plus 1. We have all these variables. Once again, something interesting can happen when any of them go to 0, right? So what, what interesting thing happens when one of the xij go to 0? The xij's are just the internal propagators, right? So what happens is the same as what happens before. An internal line goes on shell, but now I have a one loop set of diagrams. So just think about it for a second. What happens if an internal loop goes on shell? How do we factorize? We factorize with something that has the one loop is on one side or the other, right? So maybe the one loop is on this side, 
and on the other side is tree. Okay, so one kind of factorization, so if I now talk about one loop, one kind of factorization for one loop should look like before. Should, but now it should have a one loop on one side and a tree on the other side. Right? But there is another kind of factorization that we can, it's not factorization, another kind of singularity that we should also have at one loop. So to see that, let's go back, let's just draw a picture. And this is just meant to be suggestive. So let's say I have four points like this. Okay? This diagram doesn't have any of the xij's in it, right? It doesn't have any internal propagators. It only has four loop variables. Okay? But what happens as, let's say, this loop variable, this propagator goes to zero? What happens if that propagator goes to zero is, well, you know what happens. It's as if that line isn't there, but because the propagator is going on shell, it's as if I have a massless particle, right? It's, in fact, as if I have two massless particles with equal and opposite momentum. Okay? This is called the forward limit. Okay, so if you take, if you cut an internal line at one loop, then what you should get is a tree amplitude, but with two extra particles in this configuration where they have equal and opposite momentum. Is that clear? So this is another kind of singularity that we need to have that if I put one of the internal guys on shell, I have to get just the tree amplitude, but with two extra particles. Okay, so this is another thing that I need, another kind of boundary I need, is I also have to have a term that looks like a tree, but with two extra guys. Okay? So this is, the, this is the kind of factorization pole structure that these fancy functions have, which reflect locality and unitarity. The analog of the factorization, the simple factorization at tree level, are that we have two pieces. We have a one loop tree factorization, as well as a kind of a genuine tree thing, uh, which is when you cut an internal, an internal propagator, and you should get two extra that you get something tree with two extra points. So, just to have a sort of a fantasy in mind of what it is that we're after, right? Let's say I want to do a, some kind of geometric shape, polytope something, for four point at one loop. Okay? All, right away, let's make a guess. What is the dimensionality of this guy? What do you think the dimensionality of this guy is? What dimensional space should this live in? Like, what did we do in our, in our six-point tree example, right? The object lived in how many dimensions? Three dimensions. And where did that three come from? Three was the maximum number of poles that I could have. OK? So what about in this example? If there's going to be some kind of polytope, shape, something, what do you think it's, what dimension should it live in? Four. Right, because every one of these one-loop diagrams has four poles in it. Okay, like the box there. One, two, three, four. Right. One, two, three, four. Even that. One, two, three, four. And we have all these funny diagrams. We need to have all of them. We include all of them. Only if we include all of them will this work. By the way, this is a very interesting thing. When you think about tadpoles, maybe even bubbles, certainly tadpoles, like, oh, I hate tadpoles. Let's throw them out, right? Um, it's true they integrate to zero, or they're the cosmological constant problem, <laughs> depending on how you want to think about it, OK? Um, uh, but in this story, we're talking about the integrand. You cannot throw them out. Okay? If you throw them out, everything is fucked up. Okay, because it is, for example, I told you that when you factorize the loop, when you cut an internal propagator, you better get the tree. But the tree includes a diagram 
that looks exactly like this if I cut this thing open, right? That's a piece of the tree amplitude. <laughs> so I can't not include that. If I, if I don't include that, I mess everything up. Okay? I really have to draw every single planar diagram, right? Put them all together and see, see what I get. All right, so this is, again, a little impressionistic, but if there is some kind of polytope at one loop for phi cube theory, it has to live in four dimensions, so it's some interesting four-dimensional polytope. If that scares you, we can do three-point at one loop. Three-point at one loop would be a three-dimensional polytope. Okay? Beautiful three-dimensional polytope that needs to have this cool feature, unlike what we saw before, that when we go to its boundaries, it still kind of looks that it factorized and so on, but we have to see itself at lower points times the isosahedron that we just saw. And then another kind of thing which has a tree with two more points. Okay, so this is already different. It's, it's richer. It's different than what we saw before. Okay? And so we have to learn to ask the question in this new kinematical space. Our new kinematical space has more variables in it. We have to learn to ask the question in this new kinematical space that ends up having this as an answer. Okay, now, now instead of just drawing what the picture looks like in the end, and it looks an awful lot like, an awful lot like the picture that we wrote before, but there's some, of, of course, as there has to be, there's some interesting twists. So we have this kinematic space-time, but on one end, we're, we're going to have like a brain. We're going to have an extra degree of freedom that lives on one end. Okay? Um, and you could really, if you wanted to, play around and see if you can build something which does this. What I want to tell you is a more systematic picture um, uh, for getting the ones that are going to be interesting. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and sort of skip this experimentation process, which is a lot of fun, um, but uh, to at least uh, get you to the end and give you a definition for uh, what it is. Okay. Okay, but that's, that's, that's our new challenge. Okay, so our new challenge at one loop is to figure out, to find some polytope whose boundary structure does that and to somehow see it as the answer to a question that looks like solving the wave equation, something like what, what, what we saw before. Okay? So far so good? Okay. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to first go back to what we did before. even a slightly more complicated example. All right, let's go back to this picture, and let's do something we did not do before, <clears throat> which is actually describe I want to describe how I would actually solve the wave equation here, or, or its sort of discrete version using Gauss's law for these little meshes. Obviously, what I mean by these meshes. I want to talk about how I would solve the wave equation by time evolution. I want to talk about time evolution in this picture. Now, what do I mean by, by time evolution? Well, it's obvious what I mean, right? When you have a differential equation, the whole point is you're supposed to give me some initial conditions now, and then I can compute one point later. I can uniquely compute that point, given the data you've given me. Then I compute the new point, and then I keep going. Now I can compute for a new point that I couldn't compute before, and I keep going. We, we're used to this picture of Cauchy evolution, right? So you give me a certain spatial slice, and then I can move the slice to a later slice. And I can do that locally. I don't have to move it all up at once. I can just put a little dimple here, and then put another dimple there, and gradually move the whole thing up. And there's not unique. I can do it in many ways, right? I can foliate the space-time with Cauchy slices in all kinds of ways to go from the past to the future. So that's all we're going to do here, right? We want to figure out how can I solve. I'm trying to solve for all of these points inside here. How can I solve for them one step at a time only using local information 
in the picture, local information in the neighborhood of wh wh wherever I've solved up to this point. Okay? So for instance, what does that mean? Let's say I start with just these x's here. So that's my initial conditions, right? So, so I, 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 I have all these x's here. And the local information in the neighborhood here are just, I know what that mesh C is, I know what this mesh C is, I know what that mesh C is, I know what that mesh C is, and so on. Okay? Now, who can I solve for next in this picture? Just using the information of the meshes around here, I can't solve for that guy, obviously. I can use Gauss's law to solve for that guy, no problem. We did that before, right? We, we, we did, we wrote this big, we wrote this big mesh, and we used Gauss's law to solve this plus that equals that plus that. Okay? But that uses lots of information. I only want to use the information of the, about the meshes that are adjacent, that are just touching, involving the, the points uh, that I see in this picture. So look at this. Who can you solve for next? There's a unique guy you can solve for next here. Who can you solve for next? Can you solve for this guy? No? Because it's this plus this minus that. I don't know that. You can solve for this guy. Okay, so this is the first new guy you can solve for. Okay, cool. So our initial surface is these point fucking. Shit, Sorry. I hope my mom isn't watching this video. Right. So those are the initial points that I can solve for. The next things that I can solve for are this, 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 and that. That's what I get at the next step. Okay, so let me just put, this was step one, 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 one. Now at the next step, this is step two. I still have this guy, two, two. This is who I have for the next guy. Okay. Now, who can, now who can I solve for next? And I can solve for that guy. That's a step three, let me not keep writing it. Now who can I solve for? Solve for that guy. I can solve for that guy. And now I have some choices at this point, actually. Right? I can decide, I mean, I can solve for this guy next, then I can solve for that guy, and that guy, that guy, that guy, and that guy. But there are actually a few other ways I could have done it uh, along the way. Okay? So is it clear what we're doing? We're just trying to solve one step at a time for the next variable using the local information about the meshes and the neighborhood of whoever we've solved to up, the, up to that point. Right? That's practical time evolution on a computer. Right? That's, <laughs> you want to figure out where the next point is. This is like practical time evolution. Okay? All right. Now I'm going to do something a little, uh, a little more interesting. I'm going, to, I'm going to represent this rule of time evolution in a slightly more abstract way. And to do that, I'm actually, instead of drawing this picture in space-time, I'm going to start from the original picture like this. So let me label those original points. Original, let, let me label these original points uh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4. Never mind which x's they are. I'm just going to label them 1, 2, 3, 4. And associated with that picture, I'm actually going to draw a graph. 1, 2, 3, 4, but with er directed arrows. Okay. Now, what do the direction of these arrows mean? The direction means that there's an arrow from A to B if B is in the future of A. That's it. All right? But now you see every collection of guys that we got along the way is associated with a picture like this. Okay, so let's look at what happened to the first step. We had one, two, three, four, and we managed to solve for this new guy. So what is, what is that picture associated with this collection of four guys? So this is step one. 
Step two is now I have this new variable there, but the arrow is inverted into that guy. Right? That guy is to the, this guy is to the future of two. Okay? That guy is inverted. So let me call that five. My new point there is five, right? Then I have two, three, four. That's what I did at the next step. Now what do I do with the step after that? Next step after that, I went here. So what do I see at the third step? Still five there. But now it's like this. Is this clear? And at the fourth step, and so far we've been doing this by staring at this picture and translating it here. But can you stare at this picture and figure out what the rule is for what we're doing? Any, any patterns you see? Like in the first step, we only got to touch one. So what's special about one in that first step? Huh? Well, yeah, we're using the word past and future just at the level of the picture. Of the picture. Exactly. One only has outgoing arrows. One is a source. Only a source. Okay, and then we go to the next step. And when we, when we go to the next step, we got to turn two to six. And what was special about two? Two was purely a source. It only had outgoing arrows. Okay? All right, so... We've abstracted away a rule of time evolution. Give me, a, give me a graph. Let's say it's a tree graph, OK? Like it is a tree graph here. Give me a graph. And any tree graph has a property that there's at least one. There might be more than one, but there's at least one node that is purely a source. Okay. If there's no node that's a source, you can go around and make a loop. Okay, so any graph which is a tree uh, is guaranteed to have at least one node, one vertex, which is purely a source. To get the new graph, just reverse all the arrows. <laughs> reverse the direction of all the arrows into the graph, and you get a new tree graph. It's the same tree graph. The picture never changes. All I do is ever change the orientations. OK? Now, on top of that, in this picture, we have the wave equation, right? So what is the wave equation in this picture? So let's, let's write it here, right? So the wave equation in this picture is, um, for example, in the first step, x5 plus x1, in the first step, x5, x5 plus x1 is equal to x5 plus x1 minus 0 minus x2 is c. Let me write them down here. So, so what I can do is sort of draw a picture that here, this is the guy I touched because this was the source. So I touched, or the formal word is mutated. Okay? I mutated this vertex to that vertex just by flipping the sign of all the arrows. I used to have a bunch of variables, x1, x2, x3, x4 associated with these guys. And now there's going to be a new variable associated here x5, that was the whole point. I solved for it, right? So the formula is x5 plus x1 minus x2 equals some constant, OK? In the next step, I mutated 2. And the formula is, from the picture, x2 plus x6 minus x3 minus x5 is equal to some other constant. I'm not going to bother 
uh, giving them different names. OK? And so on. So here I mutated this guy, and it would be x3 plus x7 minus x6 minus x4 equals constant. Again, the whole point is that I'm time evolving. So I'm solving for the next, for the next variable. Now, once again, we read these rules off from our Gauss's law picture. But how could we read them off just from, the, from that graph or from that quiver? That thing is called a quiver. Any graph where you give an orientation, a direction to the arrows, is called a quiver. If you're a model builder, it's called a moose. Okay, the, but that's a long story. Uh, um, but mathematicians are more fancy, and they call them quivers. Okay, so, um, All right, so given a quiver like this, how could I write down those equations without going back to that space-time picture? For example, how do I figure out that the formula is x2 plus x6 e minus x3 minus x5? Exactly, right? The guy's a source. Okay, so the, so the formula is simply when I mutate from v, when I mutate from v to v prime, the formula for v prime is that xv prime plus xv minus the sum of all the w's pointing to v, or pointing out of v. v out to w of xw equals constant. OK? So we have now abstracted away the rule of time evolution to the space time to a way of describing it associated with this quiver, which goes along with that picture. But now the way I've said it, I can, I can run this for any quiver. Okay? Give me any quiver. I give you a bunch of initial variables. I solve for the next one. I keep going. I demand that all of these things, equations are satisfied, and all the variables are positive. And if I do that, I'm going to get some polytope That's by construction. right? You give me any old quiver. I'm going to get a polytope associated with it. So far, so good? Now, a little bit of, uh, let me tell you a, a little bit of important fine print here. In this picture, we know when to stop. Because right? we have the space time, we keep going, and we stop somewhere. OK? Just from these rules, how do I know when to stop? So let me do a simpler, let me do a smaller example just to make the uh, situation clear. So let's say I do this example, the thing that gives us a pentagon. If I do this example, Then what is the quiver in this case? If I start with 1 and 2, well, the quiver is just this guy. The dumbest thing, right? So now I'm going to mutate here, and I'm going to get 3 and 2. And I'm going to mutate here, and I'm going to get 3 and 4. And I'm going to mutate here, and I'm going to get 5 and 4, and so on. From this picture, I could just keep on going forever, right? Here, I know I'm supposed to stop at this point, because I've solved for everybody already, OK? But here, how do I know? Right? So if I'm trying to abstract the rule away, I need to give you, uh, I need to give a reason why I'm continuing or stopping, or why didn't I stop early? Why not just stop here? Why do I keep, keep, keep going, right? OK, now this is really cool. Because it turns out that I've given you an abstract notion of time evolution, and there's actually a kind of an abstract notion of entropy as well. <laughs> I'll just show you. And this abstract notion of entropy constantly increases. And in fact, you have to stop 
at exactly the point where it can no longer increase. <laughs> okay, so let me explain what this is, except uh, it's a totally, this, this word entropy is a complete, is a complete analogy. Uh, I'll, I'll say what, what we're doing more, more precisely. Um, uh, it's very, very practical. So let's actually imagine what's going on with the shape that we're getting as we cut it out. Right? So, so let's say we're starting off with x1 and x2, x1 and x2. And at the first step, I solve for x3. Let me even forget about this picture now. We're not going to use it as a crutch anymore. So at the first step, I'm going to solve for x3 plus x1 minus x2 is c. So x3 is c plus x2 minus x1, right? And so at the first step, so actually the zero step before I do anything, I just have that x1 and x2 are positive, right? So I have this infinite upper quadrant. This infinite upper quadrant is already a polytope, if you like. But what are, the, what, what are the sort of normal vectors to the faces of this polytope? Well, the normal, the, if you like, the inward pointing normal vectors are this guy and that guy. So I'm going to keep a running picture here. I'm going to draw the, uh, the polygon that we're getting, the polytope we're getting, and also just keep track of what the normal vectors are as we go. Okay, so to begin with, these normal vectors, this is a picture of the normal vectors now, they look like this associated with variable 1, and this associated with variable 2. Okay? In other words, this is the normal vector associated with the variable, I guess, x2 going to 0. Right? This is the normal vector associated with variable x1 going to 0. Okay? So now let's look at the next step. x3 is c plus x2 minus x1. And so if I demand that x3 is positive, then what am I doing? Then I'm forcing also that you're on this side. Right? So I'm starting to carve out something more finite. Okay? So now I can't be here anymore. It's still infinite, though. Right? OK? Now let me look at this third normal vector. That's a normal vector associated with this new variable, x3. So the first one was this one. The next one was this one. And the third one is this one. And you see, it's not coincidental that the new normal vector that I get is outside the kind of cone that's swept out by all the old ones. OK? And that's associated with the fact that it's chopping out some piece of the space. Right? It keeps going to make the space smaller. All right, let's keep going. Let's look at the fourth variable. The fourth variable, x4, is, well, by these rules, x4 plus x2 minus x3 is equal to some c prime. So x4 equals x3 minus x2 plus c prime. But x3 is c plus x2 minus x1. So this is equal to c plus c prime minus x1. Now, notice here we have to do a tiny bit of algebra right, to express x in terms of the original variables. When we drew the Gauss's law picture, we immediately drew the Gauss's law diamond that just computed x for me. But you remember that the way the constant showed up in that formula was a sum of c's. Okay? So the whole point here is we're seeing one c at a time. And so when you do it like this, well, you're going to have to sum equations and do it a little more out, just trivial linear algebra to get the answer. But this is the same answer as we found before. Okay? And so now at this stage, what do we have? At this stage, remember, this was c. And once again, crucially, because the c is positive and because c prime is positive, this next wall is out here somewhere. Right? So you keep making it smaller still. OK, good. It's still infinite. All right? 
And now let me add what the new normal vector that I got is. There is a new normal vector for. OK? And now what happens in the final, final step? Sorry, I, I don't know what's final. I keep going. I'm going to solve for the next guy. x5 is equal to <clears throat> x5 plus x3 minus x4 is some c double prime. So x5 is equal to c double prime uh, plus x4 minus x3. I've just computed x4 and x3. So this is c double prime plus c prime minus uh, x2. All right, and so finally, at the last stage, I get that. I chop off that part, and that's how I get my beautiful pentagon. All right, this inside. And you'll notice that final vector is here. OK. And now from this example, we can learn what the abstract rule is for where we can mutate and when we have to stop. Right? So what would happen if I kept going? Let's say I kept going. Well, I'm going to get another wall. That other wall is going to slice this thing again. However, you can work out that it does not slice it in a predictable way. Where it slices it depends on what the constants are, how things work, and so on. Okay? So there's no universal shape that you get. Unlike this example, where when all the C's are positive, we just get this locked pentagon. It always looks like a pentagon, no matter what, what, what we do. You can say this at the level of the normal vectors. You can think of these normal vectors as just what you would get if you shut off all the C's. Right? If you just solve the wave equation with no sources, this is just telling you what, uh, what each new x is when you express it as a, as a sum of x1 and x2. So the rule is that as you evolve, every new variable that you solve, the vector associated with it has got to lie outside the cone spanned by the rest of them. So that's this sort of notion of entropy. You've got to keep getting, fill out a bigger and bigger and bigger space. But if you hit a point where the span of everything you have already covers all of space, then you stop. Because anything new that you add will fail to have that property. See, if I kept going for another one, the vector would be a linear combination, positive linear combination of all the other guys that I found already. OK? So now we're done. Now I've given you a, uh, a concrete, abstract set of rules that I can apply in principle to any quiver. If I apply it, if I apply it to this uh, quiver that started off with all the arrows in one direction that looked like a chain, then that rule gives me time evolution in the space time. And it tells me where to stop. It tells me everything about the uh, space time without actually seeing the actual space time, this kinematic space time. In fact, you can do the following nice exercise. Let's say you start, remember I told you at the very beginning that we didn't have to choose this picture. I didn't have to choose. I didn't have to choose something that looked like that. I could have chosen something that looked more like that, say, or many other pictures. And in fact, you can get all of these other pictures from the rule that we talked about. If you always start with a chain, so I'm always going to start with a chain like this, but I don't have to orient them all in one direction. For example, I could do something like that. Okay. If you do that, if you follow the rules, You'll still see, you take the same number of steps before you stop. You still get an isosahedron. And you can interpret it as time evolution in a different shape chunk of the space time. Okay, so depending on how you orient the graph to begin with, you get time evolution in a different chunk of the space time. Yes. Yes, exactly. Excellent. Very good. Yeah. So, so here, uh, excellent. So, so here I could, I could do here or here. You could do either one. Okay. It doesn't depend. No. Huh? That's right. That exactly. Exactly. That is equivalent to how you decide to do the Cauchy evolution as you go up. Okay. 
Um, and in fact, there's a little bit more that sometimes there's some place where you can, in principle, mutate. And it happens close to the end. If you do some of these examples, it happens close to the end that you could keep going and you could just keep mutating here. And you're not allowed to do it because if you do it, it'll violate the rule. <laughs> that uh, It won't violate because the space is already filled, but it'll violate it because the new thing that you find is actually inside <laughs> the cone of all the previous ones that you found. Okay? So even that can happen. Right? So, so, uh, that's right. So, so there are some illegal mutations you're not allowed to do, but the only ones you're allowed to do are the ones that keep increasing the size of this cone. And then you just keep going until you can't increase them anymore because they've covered the whole space and you stop. Okay? Okay, so from here you can see that the kind of shape of this object, the shape of this polytope, doesn't really care about the way you oriented the arrows. Right? No matter how I orient it, I get another realization, other equations, but they're all evolution in different chunks of this space-time, all the same shape polytope, all the, the same factorizing structure, the same isosahedron, the same combinatorics, everything is identical. Just the specific realization is different. Okay? So it kind of makes sense to associate, kind of makes sense to associate the polytope just with this unoriented graph. So you give me this unoriented graph, if you decorate it with any orientation, and then time evolve, for the rule for time evolution, then it gives you, then the whole rest of the story goes through the way we just said, right? Okay, so now we have sort of succeeded to abstract away this picture of the kinematic space to a time evolution to the kinematic space to time evolution associated with this little chain. Okay. <clears throat> Any questions about this? Well, let me just say something at this point. I don't have time to explain this, uh, this part in detail, but I hope you'll find it very plausible. <clears throat> we know that this thing factorizes. We know that if I go to a boundary, this thing factorizes into the product of two other things like itself. So how do you think that fact is sort of reflected in this picture? So when you go to a boundary, you're going, so the dimensionality of the polytope is just the number of nodes there, right? So two nodes is the pentagon, three nodes is A3, and so on. OK, so, so somehow when we go to the boundary, we're going to a one lower dimensional thing. So how do you think going to a boundary is reflected in this picture? Take a wild guess. Just a wild guess. I'm not judging anyone. <laughs> yeah. You remove a node. OK, so let's see what happens when you remove a node. Look at that. It factorizes into the product of two lower things. OK, and it factorizes in every possible way. Right? So that's like, so this is like saying, you know, if I do it for A3, sorry, if I do it for the, Six-point scattering, that would be the picture. And one kind of boundary is when you delete that node. Well, that's five point times nothing, which is three point, right? Another one is when you remove the middle node. That's four point times four point. And similarly for, for the one on the other end, OK? So all the kinds of boundaries that you get correspond simply to removing nodes from this Thinking diagram. So I haven't told you it's a thinking diagram. It's this diagram. OK? OK. Now let me tell you, uh, now let me tell you an, a, a, an amazing fact. OK, so amazing fact. OK. Let's say you try to run this time evolution for any quiver. So it's well defined, right? You give me any initial graph. Here are some initial graph. Let's take this guy, and I know what I'm doing, right? I'll take it, 
I'll mutate, keep going, keep going, see what happens. Okay, you do that example, put it on the computer. Okay? You'll find it never ends. Just keep going forever, it never ends. Okay, so you do another one. It didn't have to be a tree. Actually, it has to be something that's known as acyclic so that there's just no loop to begin with. So let's say I start with that guy. Okay? I can start with that guy. Then I can also, I would have to mutate at this thing, right? And then after I mutate, the arrows would go in. And so then next time I could mutate at that guy. Arrows go in. So then I can mutate at, oh, what did I do? Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't do it right. Yeah, anyway, I could mutate at the, at the next guy and so on, right? So you do that one. Should be some nice three-dimensional shape. Never ends. In other words, as you draw these pictures of the normal vectors, they just don't fill out space. They get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they just keep going, and they sort of asymptote to certain directions. They don't fill out space. And it's sort of fairly easy to see that as you mutate, I'll give you some intuition for it. These are like linear equations. So if you think about it, there's some new variable, some matrix times the old variable. And so as you keep going, you start becoming dominated by the largest eigenvalue of this matrix. And so if that eigenvalue is like bigger or smaller than one, you're just going to go somewhere. You're going to asymptote somewhere. But if you have an asymptotic, that's bad for covering all of space. Okay? So something very special has got to happen for you not to have big or small eigenvalues so that you have a chance of covering all of space. Okay? So that's some intuition for why this is hard to do. Okay? If you draw a random quiver, you'll just keep going forever. Okay? It won't stop. You don't get a finite fixed polytope by the time. You're, you're never done. Okay? So the amazing fact is, if I consider the time evolution for any quiver, it only stops when the quiver is an orientation of, in other words, just putting arrows on, a Dinkin diagram. And the fact that Dinkin diagrams show up here has nothing on the face of it to do with the classification of Lie groups. Okay? It's a completely different appearance of Dinkin diagrams. And indeed, it's a mysterious thing in mathematics that Dinkin diagrams show up in two or three different places with very different questions. They're not remotely obviously related to each other, and this is, this is one of the three. Okay? So this is uh, an interpretation of one of the three ways that they uh, show up. So, in fact, so, so that means that I have, that means that the quivers that work are an, bn, or cn, which depend on how you orient this, dn, these are the classical ones. And then we have the exceptional ones. I won't write them all down. E6, E7, E8, G2, and F4. OK? Now, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of um, uh, extra thing. Uh, what do I mean by mutation for this quiver? It has a double arrow, right? So there's a very small modification of the rules. If you only allow literally what I said, nothing else, then you only get the uh, a, D, and E. Only the Dinkin diagrams with no double or triple lines. So the so-called simply laced Lie groups. Okay? To get the other ones, uh, you have to allow a slight extension of the rule, which is that in this formula for time evolution, instead of having x, x plus x prime just equals the sum of v to w x w, you're allowed to put some integers in front of that x w. You're allowed to put a weight in front of the xw. So if you allow a slight extra freedom to have weight on xw, it's still a finite set of possibilities. But the entire set of possibilities that you get, also allowing some constants in the third term, is all Dinkin diagrams. 
and then the number of arrows tell you what the weight is. <laughs> okay, so in this case, when I do the, uh, in this case, when I do the mutation, there will be a factor of two in the x plus x prime formula. Okay, there will be a factor of two in the sum of x to w piece. If you do g2, there will be a factor of three, because g2 has three lines in it. Okay? In fact, I invite you to do the following exercise. You take three arrows like this, you start with one and two, and your mutation rule is x3 plus x1 minus 3x2 equals c. But then at the next step, it would be x4 plus x2 just minus x3 equals c prime. So remember, it's oriented like that. So in one direction, there's a 3, and the other direction, there isn't. OK? And I invite you to just solve these things. And if you find them, you find they close into a beautiful octagon instead of a pentagon, a beautiful octagon. If instead of putting a factor of, if instead of putting uh, a 3 there, you put a 2, then you find that it closes into a hexagon. Okay, beautiful hexagon. You put any other integer, it's crap. Never closes. Right? So that pentagon, hexagon, octagon are the answer to this question. Okay? They're the, and there are all the two-dimensional Lie groups, and they're all the two-dimensional Dinkin diagrams. But anyway, that's, uh, that's a little bit of a uh, detail. OK, but all of these cases do have a closed polytope associated with them. And the AN case, the AN case is the one we know and, uh, we've known and loved in these lectures, is the isosahedron. Clearly, BN, CN, and DN, they have an N in them that you can make as big as you want. So these things have a chance to have something to do with amplitudes, right? The exceptional ones are also there. We have no idea what they mean, right? I mean, what kind of amplitude only makes sense for eight particles, right? Who knows? That, that there's no, uh, but um, whatever, whatever that would even mean. It would be a fixed number of uh, particles. Maybe they have a meaning. It would be interesting to find a meaning for them. But let's stick with these guys for a second. And I've, in principle, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but I've in principle told you exactly how to define it, right? Let's say I want to do D4. Let's say I want to do D4. I've told you everything you need to know. You can just put it on Mathematica. It's, you can even do it by hand. If I give you D4, I can, for example, this, keep these things named one, two, three, four. And then I would keep going. I would mutate, for example, I would mutate at this source. I would mutate and mutate and keep going. Now, but you have to do the work to see where it stops. Okay? And it turns out that it stops after 12 steps. If you actually do it for dn, it stops after n squared minus n steps. So there are a total of n squared variables. And in fact, you can represent all of the variables that you get in a mesh that looks exactly like the space-time mesh that we talked about before. It's just that it has this little doubling of the antenna. So if the picture we had before, so if you want to go back, this might be a little too impressionistic to be useful, but if you want to go back, uh, if we drew this picture of our strip, if this is what we had for our kinematic space before, we're sort of thinking about all of these when I draw like a, a mesh like this, I can really think of this as putting on one piece of paper every one of the quivers that I see as I mutate. Right? And that's just what we did. First we saw this one, then we saw that one, then we saw that one, then we saw that one. We, if we plunk all of these things down, then we're capturing in one spot in a way that evolution looks like evolution the small mesh 
uh, solving for the next variables from the old ones, all of the ones that we see in this picture. And you can do exactly the same thing with dn. It's just that in that picture, it looks, I mean, the n part has got to look the same, so at large n. But at the end, you get some little doubling. You get two things here. So everywhere here, there's, there's two things because there's an antenna here. So this is very impressionistic. Um, but, but there's a very precise picture like this, where it's really like you take all these dn quivers, you lay them one after the other, and you join them up with meshes. And you join them up with meshes just telling you how you mutated. And if you do that, you just get a picture that looks again like a space-time, except on one end, there's this little doubling. There's like an extra variable. So that's why I said it's as if you have a kind of a brain that lives on one end of the space with an, with an extra variable there. Okay, so that's what the DN picture looks like. OK? But so there is a, there is a space-time picture associated with this, but it has a little bit of extra structure on one of the boundaries. But now I want to make a claim that this dn polytope gives us one loop amplitudes for the biadjoint phi cube theory. And uh, we could verify this directly from taking these equations, seeing what happens when I send x to 0, seeing that it factorizes properly. We could see it from the space-time picture. You can do it just like we did everything else. Okay? But since I don't have that much time, let me motivate why it has to be true in, in, a, in, a more, in this sort of more abstract way. but also sort of very vividly makes you realize why dn is special. So let's go back and remember that an, which was tree amplitudes, factorization, the boundaries look like removing a node, right? And it looked like a cross a. So let's do the same thing for dn. All right. Now what can we do? Okay, like I can remove this node. So what does that look like? Looks like A cross D. Remember, that's what the one loop was supposed to look like on factorization, right? Okay. There's one more thing I can do. What does that look like? Just a single A. That's the forward limit. OK? So I hope that convinces you that this dn polytope is the real deal. <laughs> okay? so, and indeed, it captures, correctly captures uh, the factorization. Now, something that might bother you a little bit is what are these two guys? So there seems to be this funny symmetry between this and that. And this is an interesting peculiarity, because in this story, it turns out that the loop variables are doubled. Every loop variable is represented by two different kinds of variable. And I don't have time to explain it in, in detail, but this whole polytope, well, let me try to give a picture for it. Actually, let me try to give a, I will try to, uh, yeah, because this is, this is an, an important general point. Yeah. I should have, I think I should have made this general point uh, uh, I could have made this general point earlier as well. <clears throat> so <clears throat> what is this notion of mutation that we talked about? This notion of mutation actually has a very natural meaning. OK, it's a very natural meaning. Um, but let's go back for a second and think about, again, just the back in the story of the isosahedron. Let's think about what we learned. You know, we learned that all of these, all of these uh, planar phi cube diagrams are all triangulations of the polygon can be thought of as vertices of this isosahedron, right? Very cool. One of the qualitative features of that, though, is that if you think in terms of just Feynman diagrams as summing diagrams, you don't have any notion that this diagram is close to this diagram, far from this diagram. The diagram is just individual beasts 
They're their own thing. You're supposed to add them all up. You don't care. One doesn't care about the other, right? Whereas the fact that the fit is vertices of a polytope gives you a notion that this diagram is sort of close to that one because it's connected by an edge to that one, right? Like in, in, in the polytope, this guy can be connected by an edge to that one. There's another diagram very far away that it can't be connected to, OK? Now, how do we go from one diagram to one of its neighbors in the polytope? What does it mean to go from a diagram to another diagram that is connected to by an edge? Let's think about what it means at the level of the triangulation. So at the most trivial level, the most trivial level for, for the n equals 4, here we had a triangulation here, here we have a triangulation there. And so what are we doing? We're just taking a quadrilateral, and we're triangulating it this way, but we're flipping it to triangulate it the other way. Okay. There's nothing else going on in this case. And the level of the diagram, it's like I take this S-channel diagram, and it's like, as I go into the middle here, it's like I'm scrunching it to the full four point, and then I'm unscrunching it back to the three point on the other side. Right? That was a picture that we talked about before. And the same is true for any diagram, actually. If you take any diagram, there's a notion of mutation where you can take any S-channel propagator in the diagram, scrunch it, and blow it back up into a T-channel, or the other way. Right? So if you do that, you can start from one diagram, and then there's other diagrams that you can reach from that guy just by scrunching this ST move. And all the ones that you can reach from that guy are the diagrams that are connected to this one as vertices of the isosahedron. OK? So that's the sort of novelty, is that we have a picture of a diagram related to another one. And so you can start walking around the diagrams from one to the other, OK, um, in a way that you would never even think about if you're talking about just finding diagrams, right? But somehow this polytopal picture tells you that it's useful to think about the diagrams that are related to each other by this basic move. And this basic move is shrink the S channel, blow it back up in the T channel, and vice versa. Is that clear? OK, so <clears throat> let's see what that looks like at one loop. So let me just put on this side that dn is n point one loop amplitudes. So this is an n-dimensional polytope. By the way, let me make another small comment before I sh show you what I want to show you. Sometimes people ask, why do you care about these super complicated amplitudes with 50 points on the outside and so on? Don't we only care about 2 to 2 scattering, mostly? These other things, you know, 2 to 2 is totally boring. It's this little interval, right, tree level. So you're, why do you care about these much more complicated things? OK, you make it more complicated, you get some more fancy picture. But why do, why, why do you care about it? The thing is that you have to care about it if you care about the full quantum mechanical theory. Okay, if you care about the full quantum mechanical theory, even for 2 to 2 scattering, then inside 2 to 2 scattering, inside the 4.1 loop is a 6.3 as one of its cuts. And it's sort of literally true in these polytopal pictures. Literally a facet of the polytope is the lower tree. Okay? So that's why we see already just 4.3 tree is this utterly boring interval. 4.1 loop is already this fancy D4 polytope. OK? And it, of course, it's going to keep on going on and on. As you go to higher and higher loops for a fixed number, even four point on the outside, you get a lot of richness just from the fact that all the trees are sitting there on the inside. And all the loops are sitting there on the inside of the higher loop problem. OK? So, so in fact, if I look at what this looks like, D4 is genuinely D4. D3, so this is four point. D3 looks like this. OK, but that's amusing. D3 is the same as A3. OK? That's uh, SU4 is SO6, right? D3 is the same as A3. So 
Now, that's telling you something really interesting, and I'll leave it as an exercise for you. It's telling you that you should be able to draw one loop phi cube diagrams as the vertices of that three-dimensional isosahedron. Because <laughs> okay, A3 is the three-dimensional isosahedron. That was the six-point scattering, the Mercedes-Benz diagram at the top, all the other ones. Well, you can take exactly the same picture and decorate the vertices with one loop cubic diagrams for three points. Okay? That's a nice challenge for you to figure out how to do that. So the clue is at the very top, instead of the Mercedes-Benz diagram, you just have the, the triangle. The right? top starts with the triangle, and as you go down, you start getting bubbles and tadpoles. Uh, but you should be able to fill out that exactly the same three-dimensional shape with the pictures of one loop. Okay, with the little extra uh, proviso I'm just gonna, I'm gonna tell you about in a moment. So what about two point? Two point is like that. So that's just A1 cross A1. S, this is SO4 is SU2 cross SU2, right? This is uh, at the level of uh, Lie groups. Okay, so in particular, if I look at two point here, it's supposed to be A1 cross A1. This one is an interval, this one's an interval, so this thing should be a square. Right? An interval cross an interval is a square. All right, so let's do bubble diagrams at one loop. Right? One loop, one loop, two point diagrams. I somehow need to be able to arrange them as corners of a square. So let's see how that can work. So here I start off with the obvious diagram. Okay? There are two propagators here. And now I want to see who it can be connected to. Let me draw it down here. Right. Who can this be connected to? Well, remember, we learned that who it's connected to is to take one of the propagators, shrink it in the S channel, and grow it in the T channel. Right? So what happens if I grab this top guy, and I shrink it in the S channel? and I grow it in the T-channel. What do I get? Okay. What happens if I do it to the bottom one? Sorry, to the top one. But now the whole point is that I should be able to do this on anybody, right? So let's say I go, the, uh, uh, so I shrunk this and I grew it into that. So what happens if I take this and I shrink it, I go back to here, right? That just means that this process squares to one. If you shrink an S channel, grow it in T. If you shrink that T and grow it back into S, you go back to where you started, okay? So, so this is meant to be this should be the vertex of some two-dimensional shape, so it has to have two places it can go. Good. This guy goes to two places. This thing needs to be able to go to two places. If I, if I hit, if I mutate that guy, it goes back to where it started. But I have to have some rule for what happens when I mutate that guy. And now this is not obvious, what it means to shrink this in the S channel or, you see, for the tadpole, it's not obvious what to do with the tadpole. And similarly on this side. Okay, now, what this dn polytope is doing is doing the following. Is it completing it like this? But the way you're supposed to think about this is like, here's a variable x loop 1, x2. Here, there's a variable x1 still, but this is like a tadpole variable, right? This story actually, even though this is the diagram that we draw with it, and so the function that I would associate with this is 1 over x1 times, let's say, tadpole 1. But instead of tadpole 1, they call it x tilde 1. So you associate an x1 and an x1 tilde with a tadpole. One of them is the loop variable, and one of them is the tadpole propagator. It's important to give these things names, because literally they're zero, right? That's why tadpoles are bad. So in this story, we're giving them all names. 
instead of saying it's zero, we're calling it the tadpole propagator. Okay. So in the end, we're getting some rational function that has all of the normal stuff, and where there's tadpoles and bubbles, they all have names. Later, we can figure out what we want to do with them. Okay, but this is just grouping all the diagrams together, giving us the answer, summing all, all the diagrams together. Okay, but this diagram is called x1, is somehow this loop and the tadpole part, they always come together, and they're treated symmetrically. So this is x1 and x1 tilde. So that when you mutate this, what you're supposed to go to on this side is just something which everything is tilde. Okay, so that's a funny thing that you have to do in order to make these mutations make sense from this language. You have to double all of the loop variables. Okay. All the loop variables have to be doubled. There's one kind, there's an x kind, and there's an x tilde kind. And all the tadpoles are associated with x and x tilde treated symmetrically. Okay. All right, so that's literally what, this, uh, what the D2 polytope does and what the DN polytope does in general. And it's clear that there's a Z2 symmetry because the Dinkin diagram has a Z2 symmetry, right? I can interchange the two antenna. Okay, so that's a Z2 symmetry of the entire problem. But there's something else that you could do if you saw this picture. You could say, well, it's up to me to sort of invent what the mutation rule is. So I like this rule that I shrink S and grow T whenever it makes sense. But when I have this picture with a funny tadpole, isn't there a natural rule that I can come up with with how to mutate this? I'm trying to figure out what to do with this, right? So what should the rule be? It's that. Right? And that's tantamount to saying that you have the square, but the square has an up-down symmetry. And just so slice the square in half. Just slice, slice the square in half. And then the, the variables that you keep are only ordinary loop variables. And then one global variable for the tadpole. Okay, so in this picture, so just, just, just to be clear now, what we're saying in this picture is that I go from x1, x2 to x1 and some variable t for the tadpole. And then here I have t and x2. And now everything makes sense, right? If I start here, if I mutate x1, I shrink x1 and grow. So x1 mutates to t. t mutates back to x1, right? Similarly, x2 here mutates to t up there. But now we want to figure out what does x1 mutate to when there's a tadpole there, x1 mutates to x2. And I just flip the tadpole from one side to the other. OK, so that's another way of, uh, of defining the mutations once you have these tadpoles. And it turns out that this is actually precisely what you get from the DN polytope. If you take the DN polytope, it has this Z2 symmetry, and you just slice it on the equatorial plane. You just slice it in half. Then what you've done when you slice it in half, if you introduce a single new face, Right? Single new face when you slice it in half. All the diagrams that lie on that face turn out to be the tadpole diagrams. And the variable associated with that new face is the tadpole. Okay? All right, so that's the little bit of uh, extra fine print uh, in this case. So now I didn't show you how this works in detail, but um, uh, but uh, but I uh, but I hope you got the uh, the basic idea. Um, that, that we, we started with this picture of a wave equation in the kinematic space. And, um, and, and this causal structure in kinematic space was capturing, the causal structure in kinematic space was capturing uh, compatibility of poles. The wave equation and positivity uh, cut out the isosahedron and gave us an understanding for why there was a polytope that factorized on its boundaries with the vertex structure given by all Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams are one triangulation. There are many triangulations. 
Uh, Feynman diagrams obscure the fact that there is a projective invariance of the full answer that you only get when you sum over all the terms. Other triangulations make it more manifest. Every one of those statements is true here as well. Okay? So there's a polytope. Uh, the polytope captures factorization. And uh, there's projective invariance. Um, Feynman diagrams obscure it. But there's a recursive formulas that make it obvious. Okay? And the magic here was that we, we, we had to abstract away. You know, it was very natural to think about time evolution in this kinematic space, a very natural thing. The magical step was this decision to think about it in this slightly more abstract way with a rule of mutating quivers. Okay? Um, you, you could ask, what if you didn't do that? What if you just decided that you're going to play? You're going to play around, right? You're going to play, try other things, try other shapes, other meshes, and so on. And I actually think this is a good, good thing to try. Okay? So uh, we don't know. There might be all kinds of other interesting objects that we can directly find in this experimental way just playing around. But what I can tell you is that it's more non-trivial than it looks at first to have an object which is, whose shape is locked. Okay? That's the sort of magic, is that no matter what we do with these constants, we always get the same shape. We don't have to make any arbitrary choices. Uh, we always get the same shape, and that's exceedingly easy to uh, screw up. Okay? So, uh, so I think it's very interesting to try to just experiment with the shapes that you get, basically starting from this wave equation picture, putting in a brain, putting in different boundary conditions, just see the sort of thing that you can get. This story about this time evolution and connecting to Dinkin diagrams this is where the word cluster algebra makes an appearance that I've promised, I've said a few times that I'm not telling you anything about. And as I hope you, you saw, what I told you was self-contained. So I didn't need to say any of those fancy words. But there was, this, there was this little abrupt move where we decided to think about time evolution in this fancy way with a move on a quiver. Okay? If you're a cluster algebraist, all you do all day long is these funny moves on quivers. And so that's, that's, that's natural from that uh, point of view. Okay? Um, but so this fits very nicely into uh, a kind of rich mathematical framework that's been developed over you know, the last 10, 15 years. Um, uh, and there's a lot of mysterious things within mathematics about these, about these objects. For example, let's say I want to move beyond one loop. Great. I know what to do. Um, I, know, I know the uh, clue now. Ah, so, sorry. One last thing I wanted to tell you before, before moving on to higher loops. OK. How could we guess these pictures? How could we guess these pictures um, of the quiver? Right? Uh, we got this picture of a quiver from a kind of indirect way. Right? We, we went, we drew these x's, we drew this kinematic space, we had this mesh. So we decided to think about time evolution and so on. OK? Now I want to tell you a much more direct way of getting this quiver. OK? There's a much, much more direct way of getting this quiver. Let's go back to our picture. We have triangulations, even at tree level, we have triangulations of a polygon. So there's a triangulation. That's one of our Feynman diagrams. OK, but associated with one of these triangulations is a quiver. This is how you make the quiver. So you take every point, every midpoint of the arcs, and you mark them. The ones that are on the outside, you mark with a box. They're a little different. You call them frozen. But anyway. So is it clear what I've done so far? I just put a point in the middle of every edge and every chord in the triangulation. Next, I put a triangle inside every one of these things. Okay, so like here, inside this triangle of the triangulations, I actually put a triangle. You use a different color, chalk. So you draw this oriented triangle. It's oriented clockwise. Okay? Similarly here, 
another clockwise oriented triangle. Similarly here. Similarly here. Okay, picture looks like a bit of a mess, but let me only focus on the dots on the inside, okay? If I only focus on the dots on the inside, here they are, and let me only focus on the arrows between the dots, I get a quiver. Okay? Now, furthermore, let's see what happens if I take this quiver, and let's say I take this edge, how did I draw it before? Like this one, right? Now, our notion of, the notion we just talked about of mutation, right? That we take a quadrilateral and we triangulate it the other way, right? And that's exactly the same as shrinking an S channel and growing it in a T channel. So here, it would mean I would take this guy, get rid of it, and replace it by that guy. Okay, so let's draw our new quiver associated with this. Okay, so it's the same, same thing. Dumpty dumpty dum. And once again, let me only focus on the quiver associated with the middle guys. Okay, so what have I done? I mutated this guy, right? I flipped this diagonal to that one. So this is the thing that I touched. And what happened to it? I flipped all the arrows. Yes, you really need to draw these small, small triangles, okay? You really need to draw these small triangles. Yes, yes, huh? We got the four bangers in the same orientation. Yes, all the triangles have got to be done in the same orientation. Okay, and in fact, the general rule for a mutation is just this. So, so uh, and in fact, the general rule just is the following, and you just abstract it away from this example. Remember, in what I told you before, we are always mutating in the special case where the guy was either a source or a sink. In general, there might be a node that's neither a source nor a sink. So I need to tell you what the rule is in general. And the general rule for mutation, the general rule for mutation is that A at a vertex B, you you, uh, general rule for mutation of any quiver at a vertex V. So first, you reverse all arrows incident on V. Second, now there's some new rules. So, uh, and just, just do one. Second, if there used to be if before you mutated it, V, if there used to be some way, there's some A that went into V and V went into B, see, now you're going to reverse all the arrows. But you somehow want to remember that you could have gone from A to B before through V. So if this is there, add an arrow from A to B. And finally, if there's any closed loop, delete it. Get rid of any bubble like that. So you see that the rule that we talked about just at the level of the quiver, the rule that we talked about at the level of the quiver was just rule one, because rule two and three were not relevant, because there was only a source. Okay, so I never had a situation of something like this. But in general, this is the more general rule, and you can actually just read it off from this picture, even for the hexagon. 
Okay, so for instance, for instance, let's say I want to take uh, what's a, what's a good example? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Here's a good example. Let's say I start with uh, this guy. Okay, so let's do it a little more quickly. And so this is going to be tuck, 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 tuck. So this is something that looks like this. And now, once again, let me mutate on this middle guy. Okay? So what do I need to get? So first, let's actually do it on the picture. If I mutate on the middle guy and replace it with that one, and now I'm going to get my Mercedes Benz. So now what, am I, now what am I supposed to get? Now I'm supposed to get a closed loop here. Okay? So what I'm supposed to get, something that looks like that, that, and that, right? If this was one, two, three, it's going to be one, four, three. Because I mutated on the middle guy. Okay, and let's see how that happens. Now forget the picture. Let's see how that happens following from these rules. Okay, so if I'm mutating on the middle guy, I'm supposed to first reverse all the arrows. But then, since I used to be able to go from 3 to 1, I need to include an arrow from 3 to 1. So that's how I get the closed loop. All right, so this picture, so, so in this, uh, in this uh, just thinking about triangulations of a polygon and this notion of who is close to who, which two points are vertices, are vertices of the associatron connected by an edge, those are exactly triangulations that are related by a quadrilateral flip move. And if you then associate a triangulation with a quiver, that's exactly the mutation move, OK? All right, so now, I'm, now I have sort of uh, five minutes, but I've, I've come this far, so I, I might as well uh, uh, tell you, just so you see that it's not mysterious. OK, so this is, an, this is an interesting set of rules that's sort of abstracted away by thinking about triangulations of a polygon. And it lets you get new quivers from old ones, OK? Now, there's a little more that you can do if, uh, to get an algebra associated with these guys. So to begin with, for every, to begin with, you start with some initial quiver. You start with some initial quiver. And associate variables x1 through xn with the vertices. The vertices v1 through vn. And then I'm going to mutate. But the rule for mutation is the following. The rule for mutation to make a new variable from the old one is the product of the new variable with the old variable. It's a very nonlinear rule. The product of the new variable with the old variable is equal to the product of all of the w's into v of xw plus the product of all the w's out of v of xw. OK? And then you just keep going. See, it's a totally concrete, I'm not telling you where this funny rule comes from, but it's a completely concrete and simple rule. You give me any quiver, I assign a bunch of variables with it to begin with, and then I mutate at any vertex. There's a new variable at the vertex that I solve for from that formula. I get a new quiver, and I keep going. I mutate every possible way I can, and I see what happens. OK? These things are known as cluster algebras. The set of variables that you get associated with any quiver, the set of variables associated with any quiver 
along the way, are known as a cluster of variables. Right? And let me give you a quick example. Yes? Oh, I'm sorry. This is arrows coming in. All right, so let's do one example, and then I'll, I'll, I'll sum up, OK? Because I think, I think we're done, right? I think we're almost done, yeah. Let me do one example, and we'll, we'll sum up. But since I alluded to them, I might as well tell you. So example. OK, so let's start. I start with this quiver, x1, x2. All right? Now I'm going to mutate on x1. And anyone I want, I'm going to mutate on x1. So I'm going to get a new variable here. It's going to go in. And what is the new variable? Well, x1 prime x1 is equal to the product of all the variables going in to 1. There are none of them. So that's 1. Think of the exponents. Right, so it's 1 plus the sum of all part of all the variables going out, which is plus x2. OK? So x1 prime is 1 plus x2 over x1. All right? Now, notice what happens if I mutate again here. I'll come back to where I start. So this mutation trivially squares to 1. So nothing happens if I mutate that. Let me mutate that. Right, so this new variable, so in the next step here, I'm going to get, I'll have to do some algebra in our head, 1 plus x2 over x1, the arrow goes back out, and this is 1 plus 1 plus x2 over x1 all over x2. Okay, which is... 1 plus x1 plus x2 over x1, x2. Right, so this next step is a little complicated. So where have we gotten to? We've gotten to, I'm just copying it down again, 1 plus x2 over x1, 1 plus x1 plus x2 over x2. And now let me mutate here. So this is 1 plus 1 plus x1 plus x2 over x2 over 1 plus x2 over x1. Right? Now this is a little bit frightening. But But this is actually 1 plus x1 over x2. Right? So you see, something kind of cool happened. You might worry that you could already get these funny 1 plus x's downstairs, one, uh, but you don't. It exactly factors out, and what you get is 1 plus x1 over x2. Okay? So at this step, I now have 1 plus x1 over x2. 1 plus x1 plus x2 over x2. Now I'm going to mutate here. And I'm going to get 1 plus 1 plus x1 over x2 over this mess. 1 plus x1 plus x2 over x2. But what is that? That's just x2. OK? So by this point, we've gotten to 1 plus x1 over x2 and x2. And what happens when I mutate there? Just turns back to x1 and x2. Okay. So you do this crazy nonlinear operation. You mutate. You mutate five times, and it comes back to where you start. Okay. 
That five is the five of our pentagon. Five is a five of A2. And all of these clusters occur, and the cluster variables occur as vertices of the isosahedron. Okay? So if you take all of these clusters together, and two clusters are related, if the variables are related by a mutation, then all of them are, all of them are, uh, all of them are vertices of the corresponding isosahedron. Now, in in this general subject, it's been developed for around the last 15 years or so, I'd say 15, 20 years. Um, some of the early theorems were the following: some cluster algebras are finite, so that you, when you keep going, you eventually run into the same variables. Okay, just like we saw in this example. Okay, the cluster algebras that are finite are the ones where the quivers are orientations of Dinkin diagrams. Okay, so that's the first statement. The next statement is that there are some quivers that have the property that even though the variables get more and more complicated, the quivers come back to themselves. So the quivers are finite looking, even though the variables keep on going forever. Okay, so for instance, if you do this example just by hand, you just play with, the, play with what the quiver looks like, just this one, then you'll find you get this shape and this shape, and the rotations, and nothing else. And just get those two shapes over and over and over again, but the variables get more and more and more complicated as you keep on going. Okay? So some of these cluster algebras are finite quiver type, even though they're infinite as far as the variables go. Now, a remarkable thing is that the ones that are finite quiver type are, with 11 exceptional cases, they're the analog of E6, E7, E8, and so on. We forget about these finite exceptional cases. The generic finite quiver type ones are precisely those quivers that come from triangulation of surfaces. So, you see, we got our quiver from triangulating a surface in this already simplest case. If I sh if you, let's say we do the one-loop diagram. Let's say you do a one-loop diagram, and we just ask what quiver could go along with it. You take a one-loop diagram, and let's say I take this one. Then if I play exactly the same game, what would I do? I put point here, there, there, there. And if I do the same thing, I'm supposed to orient this, 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 that, 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 that. If I only pay attention to these four, what do I get? This is the quiver that I get. A ring. OK? Now a small exercise for you before dinner. Just mutate a few of these vertices. Not too many mutations. And you will turn this into E4. OK? All right? So all of the, so that's just a picture exercise for you, right? There's, n there's n no algebra, just a picture exercise. OK? And we can keep going. OK? So now, now, uh, now w w we know that there's some connection. Ooh, boy. Sorry, guys. Who, what is this? Is this important? What is this? <laughs> what is this, actually? Attendance sheet. Attendance sheet? Yes. Oh! <laughs> Wow, there's some naughty there's some naughty children here. That's uh, yeah, fascinating. I wonder I wonder what's going on at uh, there's a lot of people missing at. <laughs> hmm, okay, interesting. All right, sorry, I'll put it over here. Okay, um, all right. So so. So if you think that there's a clue, there's some kind of connection between amplitudes and these polytopes, yes? A laser pointer is lying in your puzzle, maybe. A laser pointer is lying. Oh, who cares? No, 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 no. No. This thing, this yeah, thing. Yeah, maybe just say it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Sorry, guys. I shouldn't use this to mop it up, right? <laughs> That's not cool. What is this, actually? Mike's stuff. Huh? Oh, watch out. <laughs> this is so interesting, all this stuff up here. You know? <laughs> Kyoto Robert color. Sounds exotic. <laughs> all right, very good. I really want to use this to mop it up, but I probably shouldn't, right? That, uh, all right. OK, so um, all right, so let me just, uh, I just w want to make just one, one or two more comments, and, and, and we'll end. So what, what, what I want to, uh, so, so, let's, let's, uh, uh, so let, me, let me finish telling you via classification. So there are those, there are those uh, quiver pictures that repeat even though the variables keep on going forever. And amazingly, they're associated with triangulations was that Yugi? Well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> sure, sure. You're making her take the blame for it. No, no. That's not nice. That's not cool at all. That's, you know, you're supposed to protect the youngsters, not abuse them. That's terrible. I'm disgusted with you. <laughs> okay, so, um, uh, uh, remember the things that are triangulations of surfaces are precisely dual to Feynman diagrams. At any order in the 1 over n expansion, it has nothing to do with planarity. Right? You draw any diagram you want, any genus, anything, the dual of that diagram lives on a surface. Okay? It's a triangulation of a surface. So this is, to me, absolutely amazing that you ask this sort of funny, weird, abstract question about quivers, and there is of all quivers you could think of, the ones that have the property, the rule comes back to itself, are Feynman diagrams at all orders in perturbation theory for any cubic theory. Okay? So that's a clear clue that we should think about uh, the all loop order problem somehow associated with these surface cluster algebras. And of course, the, the, the difficulty is that there's infinitely many variables. We should figure out what those infinitely many variables mean. And I'll just give you a little hint of the problem. Here's a hint of the problem. Let's say we go to two loops. Now I want to imagine that I have sort of two holes on the inside. If I want to talk about the loop variables, this would be one of the loop variables, let's say. That would be another one of the loop variables. But here's the problem. As far as the Feynman diagram is concerned, I just care about that. Just the fact that this is connected to that. But as far as the surface is concerned, there's a difference between this one and one where this winds around the other one and comes there. And in fact, I can wind around any number of times I like before hitting that guy. Okay? So there's a kind of a spurious infinity associated with the windings of the surface. In technical terms, given any surface, there's something called the mapping class group of the surface, which in this case just means you imagine taking those two punctures out twisting it around and putting it back in. <laughs> okay? And that's kind of, kind of a spurious symmetry that the surface has. The Feynman diagrams don't care about it. They want to sort of mod out by it. They want to identify all of them somehow. And so anyway, that's what we've been working on for the past couple of months to figure out how we're supposed to do that. Okay? How we're supposed to do that at the level of the polytopes to find a polytope at two loop and higher. I think we probably figured out how to do it, but it's, uh, it's still work in, in progress. Okay? Uh, and the final thing that I want to say is um, how, how from this picture, so I, I, I gave you this strange nonlinear algebra, gave you this strange nonlinear algebra, and yet everything in the talk, everything in the lectures was about these beautiful, simple linear equations. Wave equation x plus x minus x minus x and so on. So I just want you to stare at this formula x times x prime equals the product of all the w's e to v plus the product of all the w's out of v to xw. Very nonlinear formula, OK? Now let's write down a simpler non non nonlinear formula, because I'm going to tell you there's a very general phenomenon that uh, is very interesting to do whenever you have nonlinear equations of this basic type. Let's have an equation that looks like AB equals CD 
plus EF. Pretty not nonlinear equation. All right? But associated with this nonlinear equation is a sort of quasi linearization of it. Okay? You can kind of linearize these equations in an interesting way. And one way of thinking about it is to imagine what these equations look like in the limit where A, B, C, D, and E and F both become enormous. They all become huge. Imagine everything is becoming gigantic. Right? Obviously, this equation can still be true. A, B, C, D, E, F can all be positive. But just imagine they become really huge. So in other words, I want to imagine that I'm putting A is equal to E to the little a over some epsilon. And similarly, for b equals e to the little b over epsilon, c equals e to the c over epsilon, d equals e to the d over epsilon. And I'm going to send epsilon to 0. Okay? And all these variables are positive, let's say. Right? So if I do that, all these variables are becoming humongous. Now, what does this equation turn into in the limit as epsilon goes to 0? It turns into a simpler equation. Right? Because on the left-hand side, I have on the left-hand side, I have something that looks like e to the one over epsilon a plus b equals e to the one over epsilon c plus d plus e. Oh shit, e again. Anyway, one over epsilon. E plus F. OK? So as, as epsilon goes to 0, what's going on? This is becoming huge. And so only one of these two terms is going to be important, right? If C plus D is bigger than E plus F, then this term is going to dominate over that. As I send epsilon to 0, I just get the equation A plus B equals C plus D. The other way around, this one becomes important. I get A plus B equals E plus F. Right? And so starting from this equation, AB equals CD plus EF, there's a cousin of this equation, which is A plus B is the max of C plus D and E plus F. Okay? Now, you see, this equation is also not exactly linear, because that max is not a linear function. But it's called piecewise linear. Right? In other words, in big swaths of space, it's a linear equation. And then it jumps somewhere, where the two terms of the max become equal. Then it turns into a different equation. So instead of having one complicated nonlinear equation, you sort of linearize it as much as possible. Okay? You can do this for any expression involving all plus signs. Okay? So, and products. And the rule is everywhere you take a, see a product, you replace it with a sum. Everywhere you see a sum, you replace it with the symbol max. Okay? And this process is known as tropicalization. Don't ask me why. There's a funny story why it's called tropicalization. Okay? And the subject is known as tropical geometry. Okay, so you start, with, uh, um, you start with some complicated algebraic variety, and you tropicalize it, okay, and you get something, yeah, kind of like that. That's, uh, <laughs> okay? All right, so, so this is a way of simplifying. It's a way of simplifying, um, it's a way of simplifying uh, nonlinear systems in a way that sort of uh, doesn't uh, destroy, that keeps some of the intrinsic structure. And all I want to say and I'll end with this, is what happens if we take this mutation relation of the cluster algebra and we tropicalize it? Then we get xv plus xv prime is the max of either the sum of all the w's out of the xw or the sum of all the w's into v of xw. So in other words, that object that we saw in our time evolution rule, x plus x minus the sum of all the x's out of w, 
That's not a random thing. Okay? That expression is actually the tropicalization of the mutation relation. <laughs> right? And that's what's going on, is that for these general finite type cluster algebras, and this is the reason why people have started getting more interested in isosahedra and so on in the last 15 years, is they, they played with these new objects, these new quivers, just at the level of the pictures and the variables, they saw that just like in the case of AN, all of these things fit as vertices of the isosahedron. For all of these classical, for all of these uh, finite type cluster algebras, which are associated with Dinkin diagrams, there are also clusters, and they fit on vertices of a polytope. Okay? And, uh, and now, the, the story partially motivated by physics and the things that we're talking about uh, in these lectures um, in the past couple of years, uh, uh, also together with the mathematicians, we understand that this construction that I showed you today is the conceptual construction of all of these cluster polytopes. <laughs> At least in these cases where this time evolution process ends, <laughs> which is exactly the case that corresponds to finite type cluster algebras. Okay, so, so there's a, and furthermore, all of these cases have some connection to physics. Tree and one loop. The reason they have connection to tree and one loop is completely obvious from the surfaces that are associated <laughs> with the clusters. Right? If you're, once, you're, once you realize there's some connection, it was obvious that the connection had to be with the, with the, uh, with the AN Dinkin diagram, because that's the, that's the triangulation of the surface, and with the DN Dinkin diagram, because that's the triangulation of a surface with one puncture. Okay? And now the game is obvious. Right? You go to more punctures, and now we have to figure out some way to tame these infinities and figure out if there's a shape associated with it, and so on. But I should say that the fact that there's a projective form, the fact that the diagrams are not just random individual things, but one is connected to the other. And remember, the fact that one is connected to the other is what allows the form to be projective, right? That's, uh, all of these things are universal facts about this underlying cluster algebra structure. Um, and uh, so that's, that's why there's, there's uh, uh, it's not quite the isolated curiosity that I was, uh, uh, that I was presenting. Okay, so, um, but uh, this kind of physical picture of, of thinking about it in terms of wave equations and kinematic space and so on, um, uh, we don't yet know how to extend for the general cases, but neither do the mathematicians know how to think about the analog of the polytopes for the infinite cases. And so there's some very interesting opportunity for to learn something about the physics of these things and at the same time understand some way of controlling this very, very interesting mathematics as well. All right, so I didn't get to say anything about the EF dihedron, but maybe we'll talk about it in the night session. Um, and um, uh, let me just uh, uh, stop there. Thank you.